this feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. Then you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. Antiquities, a series of studies in the Bible archaeology and history. I am E. Raymond Capt, biblical archaeologist and research historian. Our Creator has revealed many things to man in many ways. In addition to the written word of the Bible, we learn from creation itself and from the archaeological record of past civilizations. This series is designed to open your understanding to many truths, some of which may be new to you. Allow the Holy Spirit, or Spirit of Truth, and the Word of God to be your guide. This series is narrated by Paul H. Johnson. As birds flying, prophecy occupies a very large part of the biblical record, but very few give the subject the study required for a true understanding. It is a sensitive area because many interpretations are given to specific passages relating to the future with an emphasis that is either unwarranted or in error. Some of the most reliable clues to the study of prophecy are found by examining history. If this is done, it can be shown that the majority of all utterances in the Old and New Testament have already been fulfilled. Others remain to be explained as future events bring them into focus. Isaiah a high-ranking official at the royal court of ancient Israel foresaw one such incident two and a half thousand years ahead of his own day. Reading from Isaiah 31, verse 5. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also he will deliver it, and passing over he will preserve it. Isaiah uses a peculiar way to speak of the capture of a city, Jerusalem, as birds flying. The prophet Daniel also foretold of this event. Reading from Daniel 12, verse 12, Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. Another prophet, Haggai, foretold the very day and the month of this same event. Reading from Haggai 2, verse 18. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. I'll explain the significance of these verses in this study. To us today, these prophecies are past history, but not long past. The study will reveal the fulfillment of these prophecies concerning the capture of Jerusalem as birds flying on December 9, 1917, by the British forces during World War I under General Allenby and the subsequent defeat of the Turkish army in Palestine. For the student of Bible history with eyes to see and ears to hear, The capture of Jerusalem completed a major phase of biblical prophecy and pointing toward the culmination of this age. Palestine for centuries has been a land of battles, bloodshed, bravery, treachery, and heroes. Few other geographical areas of the world have been so fought over. In biblical times, Palestine was a strategic land bridge a trade and buffer zone between the greater and lesser empires of antiquity. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Syria, and the Hittite kingdom were a few of the nations that sent powerful armies traversing this land. The Egyptians came under their pharaoh Ramses the Great and Tutmosis the Third. Perhaps the cruelest conquerors of all were the Assyrians, Macedonian Greeks under Alexander the Great, iron-disciplined legions of imperial Rome, and Arab and Saracen horsemen poured like locusts from the desert of Arabia, inflamed by Islam 
and the call of jihad or holy war against the infidel. The Crusaders, warriors of Christendom, led by Richard Cœur de Leon, the Lionheart of England, and Godfrey de Bouillon, briefly wrested control of the Holy Land from Saladin, the Saracen leader. Finally, the cruel occupation of Palestine through hundreds of years by the Turk, the then spiritual leaders of Islam. But the soil of the Holy Land was soon to soak up more blood and witness destruction by modern technological warfare. World War I officially started on August 1, 1914, between Russia and Germany, followed by Germany's formal declaration of war against France on August 3. England entered the war on August 4, when Germany crossed the Belgian frontier. The war in Palestine began in January 1915 with a Turkish offensive against the Suez Canal. However, it was easily beaten off. In 1916 and 1917, the British forces under Sir Archibald Murray conducted an offensive across Sinai, laying a railroad and water pipeline as they went, which was stopped at Gaza on the southern edge of the fertile plain of Palestine and was severally repulsed. In London, it was considered a shoddy performance which should have gained its objectives, and Murray was recalled to Britain. In June 1917, General Edmund Allenby was given command of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force with the responsibility of the capture of Jerusalem from the Turks by Christmas that year. In Prime Minister Lloyd George's own words, it was Allenby's responsibility to present Britain with a Christmas present, the capture of Jerusalem. Allenby was not at all keen on going to the Middle East and expressed his feelings in these words. The last man failed, and I see no reason why I should be able to succeed. Then later, a remarkable conversation took place that changed Allenby's reluctance to accept the command of the British forces in Egypt. A close friend of Allenby, General Bivoir de Lille revealed to Allenby biblical prophecies containing references to Jerusalem in two books published in 1878 and in 1880, both by H. Grattan Guinness, The Approaching End of the Age, and Light for the Last Days. The prophecies relating to Jerusalem as calculated by Grattan Guinness pointed to 1917 as the year of deliverance of the city from Turkish rule. General de Lille said that God would be with him. Allenby, in his coming conflict with the Turks, and that it appeared that Allenby had been chosen by God to fulfill the prophecy concerning the capture of Jerusalem. General de Lille also pointed out a book called The Fullness of the Nations, by another eminent prophetic biblical student, Dr. H. Aldersmith, who also calculated that Jerusalem would fall in 1917. General Allenby was deeply impressed by the words of General Delisle. Then followed a most unusual discussion which was to have deeply significant repercussions between General Allenby and Admiral John Fisher, which was recorded by Lord Fisher's secretary. Allenby was told that he, as commander-in-chief of the British Expeditionary Forces, was going to be God's instrument for the capture of Jerusalem in December 1917. Stunned by the frankness of Lord Fisher's revelation, Allenby asked politely how Britain's most distinguished sailor had come to these deductions. It is recorded that the hours rolled by as Lord Fisher explained to the astonished general the Israelitish origins of the Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, and kindred peoples and the covenants recorded in the Bible that God made to Israel, among which were prophecies indicating that Israel was to become a great nation and a company of nations, to have a new language, to have a new name, 
to colonize the desolate places of the earth, to carry the gospel to all the peoples of the world, and to be called the sons of God, meaning that they would accept Christianity, and lastly, that they would become God's instrument in destroying evil. When the conversations had ended, Lord Fisher added this, It would be absolutely essential that aircraft be used in the final assault on the city of Jerusalem, and read to Allenby these words in the scripture, As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also he will deliver it, and passing over he will preserve it. This is recorded in Isaiah chapter 31, verse 5. A somewhat bemused Allenby then thoughtfully considered all that he had heard from General Delisle and Admiral Fisher. Armed and fortified with the knowledge that he had heard, General Allenby arrived in Egypt like a whirlwind. He immediately purged the dross from among the officers, those who spent too much time propping up the bar in Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo, and they soon found themselves on the boat back to England and the not-so-comfortable conditions in the trenches on the Western Front in Europe. Allenby's energy and confidence inspired a new hope in what had been a rather dispirited army. He surrounded himself with staff officers of high intelligence and thorough army training. In a short time, Allenby had command of an army of astonishing complexity resembling a crusade. It included soldiers from Britain, India, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, with smaller contingents from Egypt, Singapore, Hong Kong, and the West Indies. In the early stages of the advance against the Turks, Allenby had to make do with rather lightweight aircraft which were hardly a match for the more advanced albatross fighters on loan from the Germans to the Turks. Knowing the value of air reconnaissance, Allenby requested five squadrons of more modern aircraft. However, only three could be spared from the Western Front, but what arrived were the best, the formidable Bristol fighter, probably the best all-around fighting aircraft of the Great War, and with these, plus the nimble SE-5 Scout, air superiority was soon wrenched from the Imperial German Air Force. General Allenby's staff knew that their assignment was to capture Jerusalem by December 1917, which gave them only about six months in which to accomplish this. Many doubted that the city could be taken by Christmas, if at all. Some were not aware that God's divine time clock was ticking, and every move, every battle won, every skirmish lost, was to be controlled by that clock and by prophecy written over two thousand years earlier by God's prophets to Israel. The situation in the midsummer of 1917 was this. To the west was the Mediterranean Sea, where the Royal Navy had sea superiority. To the east lay the endless, waterless deserts of what was in those days Transjordan. To the south lay Egypt, Sinai, and the British forces, and to the north, the enemy, the German-Turkish armies. The most direct route to Jerusalem would lie up the coast. This was the route that for centuries invaders of Palestine had taken before and after the Assyrians. However, Gaza was well fortified and had repelled two earlier British attempts to take it. Beersheba, apart from its own wells, was an area almost devoid of water, and it appeared that Gaza would have to be taken first. The Royal Navy would supply the water. Allenby felt sure that the Turks were convinced that he would attack Gaza, either in a frontal assault or a sea landing under cover of the navy, or both simultaneously. Thus he decided to reverse the logical plan and make Beersheba the primary target and Gaza the second. If he failed, the British forces would be in a worse position than were General Murray's forces the previous spring. Allenby also needed complete surprise, and Beersheba had to fall in one day, 
Otherwise, his army, both men and horses, would rapidly run out of water. To gain complete surprise, the British embarked on one of the most famous and successful acts of deception in the history of warfare. The aim was to convince the German and Turkish high commands that he intended to attack Gaza and that his movements against Beersheba was just a decoy. The plan was the brainchild of Allenby's head of field intelligence, who not only conceived the plan, but also executed it. He faked some documents which showed that there would be an attack on Beersheba to cover a new assault on Gaza. These documents were then packed with some lunch and money into a haversack. As a final stroke of genius, he enlisted the aid of a hospital nurse and he coached her to write a remarkably moving letter, supposedly from the wife of the carrier of the documents, describing the birth of their recently born son. This was added to the contents of the haversack, and he rode out into no man's land, some distance from the British lines. When he was in sight of a Turkish patrol, he dismounted and used his binoculars, seemingly to identify the enemy patrol, which immediately began firing at him, luckily missing him. Apparently in a panic, he dropped his binoculars, haversack, water bottle, and rifle, which had all been stained with fresh blood from his horse, and remounting, he galloped back towards the British lines, sagging in his saddle to make the Turks think that one of their shots had hit him. The haversack and the items he had dropped were recovered and forwarded back to German and Turkish command headquarters. The Turks were wary of a ruse, but the Germans were convinced by the letter about the baby that the find was genuine, and the plan outlined was the logical decision they had expected. Thus the Germans moved an entire division stationed at Beersheba back to Gaza, informing the Beersheba commander that possibly he might be subjected to an attack by one or two infantry brigades and cavalry from the south, but by no large mounted force. But the wily mind of the Turk, still suspicious, made plans for the demolition of the wells, the ammunition dumps, and the rail equipment. Allenby's plan was to move units of mounted cavalry and infantry by means of night marches, spending the days hidden in wadis or any available cover. It was vital that they attacked and captured the water holes before they could be blown. The attack started with the Desert Mounted Corps, making a 25-mile night ride in order to make the necessary surprise dawn attack on Beersheba on the morning of the 21st of October. 40,000 troops were ready, in position, waiting for the start whistle. That morning, an early dawn flight by a German reconnaissance aircraft spotted the masses of cavalry and hightailed it back to base with this vital news and photographs. However, the Royal Flying Corps were also early risers, and Captains Peck and Lloyd Williams, flying a Bristol fighter, attacked the German aircraft and shot it down. Possibly the whole success of Allenby's campaign hinged on this single action by the Royal Flying Corps. The attack on Beersheba went in on time and the water holes were captured only moments before the Turks could blow them up. Allenby next moved against Gaza and with the help of the Royal Navy which pounded the shore fortifications with their heavy guns after a mercifully brief fight Gaza was captured. Now the road to Jerusalem was open. The Turks were forced to retreat northwards during the next few weeks and the Royal Flying Corps had, by this time, completely dominated the skies over Palestine. December the 8th was the date set for the main attack on Jerusalem, but the problem which had been facing Allenby, the avoidance of street fighting, which would have created large numbers of casualties, had been solved. The Turkish army had withdrawn. The following day, the 9th of December, the mayor of Jerusalem and his ministers came out from the city bearing a white flag and attempted to surrender to a party of army cooks who had gotten themselves lost. 
However, they directed the mayoral party to a group of gunner officers who were too busy to attend to this distraction as they were getting their guns into a good firing position for the expected assault on the city and the now non-existent Turkish lines. By now, the somewhat disillusioned mayor and his party had been tramping about in the heat and the dust all morning, looking for someone to surrender to, but eventually they managed to come in contact with General O'Shea and his staff officers, who graciously accepted the keys of the city on behalf of General Allenby, much to the relief of the mayor of Jerusalem. The date was the 9th of December, 1917. As previously mentioned, Dr. Grattan Guinness was bold enough in 1886 to predict from Bible prophecy that 1917 would be the very year when Jerusalem would be delivered from the Mohammedan power, and he published his findings in 1878, fully 39 years before the date of the capture of the city. Dr. H. Aldersmith in 1893 also came to the same conclusion, and even suggested, and this was long before the era of aviation, that a flying craft would play a major role in the deliverance of the city. Turning back to the book of Daniel, we read in chapter 9, Daniel's prayer concerning his own city, Jerusalem. The prophet wrote that in a critical time toward the end of the age, the city would be delivered from the abomination of desolation, the Moslem power, and he indicated the time when this would occur. Reading from chapter 12 and verses 11 and 12. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. To understand the length of a prophetic day, we read in Numbers chapter 14, verse 34. After the number of days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each for a year, shall he bear your iniquities, even forty years, and ye shall know my beach of promise. Thus we are told to reckon each day as a year. Confirmation of this is found in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, wherein it is written, I have appointed thee each day for a year. Both verses tell us that God allotted each prophetic day for a prophetic year. So 1,335 days equals 1,335 prophetic years. If we take the rise of the Mohammedan power from its beginning in 622 A.D. and add 1,335 lunar years by the Mohammedan calendar, we come to the Christian year A.D. 1917. It is significant to note that there were Egyptian coins minted in 1917 bearing the Arabic numerals 1335. On the reverse side of the coin are the Roman numerals 1917. Islam as a religious movement dates its commencement from the Hagira 622 AD when Mohammed fled from Mecca to Medina where he was received as a prince and prophet. Not only is the date 1917 clearly indicated in the scriptures, but the very month and day Jerusalem would fall is shown, as recorded by the prophet Haggai, as being the four and twentieth day of the month Kislev, for which the year 1917 falls on December the 9th, the very day and month that Jerusalem fell as birds flying. Was it just a coincidence or was it God's timing that the English prayer book issued in 1871 called for the lesson to be read on the 9th of December to be Isaiah's words, As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. To commemorate their part in the liberation of Jerusalem and the land of Palestine from 400 years of Turkish domination, number 14 Bomber Squadron of the Royal Air Force 
adopted a new insignia with its motto in Arabic, I spread my wings and keep my promise. Obviously, RAF Command Headquarters recognized what future generations would come to forget, that divine intervention saved Jerusalem, and that they were instruments of God in the fulfillment of that prophecy. In his biography of General Allenby, General Wavell recounts a strange traditions among the Arabs. They stated, When the waters of the Nile flow into Palestine, then will a prophet of the Lord deliver Jerusalem from the Turkish yoke. The waters of the Nile did flow into Palestine via the water pipeline constructed by the royal engineers all the way from Egypt into a massive water purification plant installed with lines leading off to all the army units. And curiously enough, Allenby's name, pronounced as an Arab would say it, is Allah en Nebi, means prophet of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 19 verse 23 states, In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. There must have been a desert track of some sort between Egypt and Palestine for hundreds of years, but whether Isaiah's words in that day refers to the Allenby campaign is a matter for conjecture. However, in order that wheeled vehicles could bring up military stores to the front line, a wire mesh roadway was laid all the way from Kantara in Egypt, covering the soft sand of the desert. The capture of Jerusalem as birds flying is only one of the hundreds of examples of divine time measures that show, as Isaiah chapter 40 tells us, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as small dust in the balance, and that God bringeth the princes of the earth to nothing and maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. The nations of the earth have their times of power predestined by God who raises them up and brings them down according to his timetable, always mindful of his promises to his people Israel, promises which cannot be broken. I hope you have enjoyed this study in Biblical Antiquities, covering archaeological research in the Bible lands that has led to a proper understanding of the biblical text and historical events it records.